already uh, spent the money. You've already spent the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in debt. <laughs> I need this to take off. Well, it's Potter Zeeby, the comic book nerd cast that dares to ask, what, me worry? I'm your idiot, Kyle Bridget, and with me, your co-idiot, Patty McInerney. Again, though, why co-idiot? Well, I mean, it's just, you know, I think I would remember if, you know, you were co-idiot last week. So, okay. uh, you know, we just switch it up, you know? All right, sweet. All right, you know what? Let's fix it in post. Moving on. <laughs> Let's move on to the It's Rambling Men department. I got something on my mind. Yes, sir. Now, you see, when I was like 9, 10, up to about 13, I had a lot of access to cinematic full frontal nudity. Uh, <laughs> you know, I lived in a small town where we didn't have much culture, uh, but we did have was three video rental stores, video scan, video terminal and backdraft video, which ironically burnt down. <laughs> <laughs> was that before or after the release of the film? Oh, after, after. I wouldn't have known it was ironic if not for the film. And my mother, God love her, had put a note on our account at all the video rental stores that I, a nine-year-old boy, could rent R-rated movies. Yes. You know, which made sense because she was going to rent them for me anyway. So, you know, why she got to bother coming down, you know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> like, it's just a formality at that point. You know, and so between me and my buddy, because basically we'd have sleepovers every weekend and rent movies, we had rented literally every horror movie in town. You know, but also we'd rent comedies and sci-fi, action, all, all sorts of things. And, you know, on top of that, Canadian Network TV actually shows nudity. So on, like, City TV, which we got out of Toronto, they had these late-night, what they call blue movies. Tonight, Baby Blue 2 on City TV, featuring fun-loving adults in life-affirming situations. Oh, I know what blue is. What the listeners can't recognize right now is my prudish disgust with your Canadian culture. I was shaking my head back and forth at this news. Nudity on network television. Oh yeah. Um, now, I mean, you don't generally see it in, uh, you know, in uh, prime time or whatever. It's late at night. So just a side note, City TV, they had a little video booth set up on the corner of their building and it was called Speaker's Corner. Speak and be seen on Speaker's Corner. And you could just sit down there in front of the camera, press a button and just say whatever you wanted or do whatever you wanted or show whatever you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, there was a show, Speaker's Corner, you know. They'd, sh they'd show some pretty crazy stuff on there too, but I think they blurred out the nudity, except when toplessness for women became legal in Ontario. And I remember that particular episode was, you know, especially illuminating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of, it, it, this is a network show though. It's not like public access. Cause that sounds like the type of thing that would be on public access television. No, it was like a network city TV. They're probably part of like Rogers or some bigger, bigger corporation here. But uh, they, it was a full channel. You know, they had different kinds of programming. They made their own shows, but they also had other shows like reruns of The Simpsons and stuff. But that oh. was one of their things. And it was just part of the building. You could go to Speaker's Corner. Maybe it's even still there. I don't know. Uh, for a while, they had them in different towns even. Yeah, that's, a, that's really interesting to me that they would do that. I mean, certainly they would like edit them. To an extent, where oh, they yeah. curate yeah. and like pull out ones that would be interesting or thought provoking or amusing. It wasn't as interesting as you would think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because there was a lot of like duds on there, you know, because I bet you 99% of them were just like, Hi, I'm from Detroit and it's so nice to be in Canada. Oh, you're all so nice. Uh, you know, I like your coins. You all know, right. I, I'm going to go home, get shot. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but you know, but every now and again, it'd be like, there'd be like regular performers that would come down and play music or tell yeah. jokes or do little bits and stuff, you know, or just like eccentric people with weird animals and stuff. But I got to imagine when they're like going around the clock, like you're not getting that much of that yeah. gold. Oh, somebody has to watch all that too. All right. Yeah. I got you off on a tangent. <laughs> Sorry, that's easy to do. And then I also had cable. So, uh, you know, I was a big fan of this thing called the Drambui Showcase Review. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Drambui Showcase Review. 
uh, which was on the channel Showcase. And every night, they'd just show erotic art house films. You know, as close as you could get to hardcore, they would just show that on TV, which, you know, I would watch and tape on my TV and VCR in my bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was seeing a lot of nudity. So by the mid 90s, I had been exposed to a lifetime worth of like low brow exploitation films, trash cinema, and a fair amount of like softcore art films, mostly from the 70s and 80s. Which means, you know, I encountered a ton of TNA, uh, quite a bit of bush, and, you know, occasionally someone would hang dong. <laughs> you know, that was kind of like the state of nudity that was available cinematically. Yeah. And I wasn't really interested in new media at the time, you know, unless something was animated or sci-fi fantasy or like somehow outside of the real world. If it wasn't something outrageous, I just didn't get the point. But, you know, my friends understood that, you know, I was this like reactionary curmudgeon. And so they just ignored my complaints that what they were watching in the 90s it was just like watered down versions of like horror and sex comedies and all that thing. So, you know, they enjoyed like, I know what you did last summer and Scream. Uh, and it just seems so milk toast to me. Those are like horror classics, right? Like scream overtook franchises like halloween right as mm -hmm. it, it's something that gets revisited there have been oodles of sequels to those i mean it certainly isn't like sleepaway camp no it's not it's you're right it's nowhere near as good as sleepaway camp which is you know fantastic it was just like it was so watered down you know even like sex comedies like american pie which was sort of marketed as the ultimate teen sex comedy and you know to its credit had some tits oh yeah it was nowhere near as provocative as like porkies or like revenge of the nerds or something like that you know um, yeah <laughs> <laughs> But, but but hold on, like the, the provocation from those comes from, like, I don't want to throw this term around, but like borderline <laughs> rape. <laughs> well, but I mean, that's all in American Pie as well, right? You could, you could view American Pie through that sort of like rape culture lens just yeah. as easy. But, you know, there certainly wasn't full frontal nudity in them or copious amounts of it. Okay, yeah. So in terms of like what it would sort of show you explicitly, it was much more tame. What is, I have a question. So like on the scale of something like Porky's to American Pie on that spectrum, where does something like Animal House fall? I can't recall. I don't think Animal House actually does have that much nudity in it. I think it probably has some. It does have some. And it's burned into my mind. <laughs> uh, I, I don't particularly remember that one as being as full of nudity as like Revenge of the Nerds or... Uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I'm I'm a loss for titles here. There's so many. I'm just trying to think of ones that aren't like, you know, like Six Swedes in the Alps or something, you know, where it was like European movies sort of like yeah. brought over here, European sex comedies. And then I had this one friend. He was really into this movie called Wild Things, which was this sexy thriller mystery and it was marketed entirely on the babes right like this was oh yeah like the babes were front and center who but bacon he dropped trow right like oh yeah he drops trow in that movie and he shows his dick which is pretty rare actually in movies like in terms of nudity you know you see lots of tna you know a bit of bush very rarely did would you see a penis you know it was kind of like much more taboo yeah, I think that, that that scene alone of Kevin Bacon, like I understood why people are like, you know, these images of women cause girls to have like an unrealistic body expectations. Just seeing Kevin Bacon's dong gave me body <laughs> dysmorphia, like <laughs> instantaneously. <laughs> yeah, I think he's got a good one from what I recall. But the girls, I don't even think they're topless in the movie. Like it's, or it's very minimal nudity. And uh, I think this sort of marked a shift in modern cinema, or at least Western cinema. Basically, like after the early 90s, you get less female nudity overall, especially Bush, mm -hmm. and slightly more male frontal nudity. This kind of prudish shift you know, carried on through the torture porn genre, Saw. Yeah, hostile. Yeah, it's hostile, that kind of thing, which that brought kind of the gore and sadism back. But, you know, the nudity was still pretty minimal in most of those movies. And, uh, you know, it was nothing like the Nazi exploitation films of the 70s that you would see, which were explicitly torturous, you know. So uh, I was about to bring up. Yeah, do you like long for a day when Elsa, she-wolf of the SS, is going to... <laughs> Reemerge. <laughs> yes. Ilsa, you promised me. What did you call me? Ilsa. 
I mean Commandant, Fraulein Doctor. Better. Much better. Well, I don't know. I think that it's good that that film exists in that it's it's very interesting that yeah. that sort of like moment in time existed and that sort of because you know people were sort of exploring the sort of like edges of taboo in film at that point and so you have something like Sallow 120 Days of Sodom it's like that I would say is actually a really good film in a lot of ways you know like it's kind of an important film almost like a form of literature or something you know it's like a higher level but you know then you've got like Salon Kitty and Ilsa She-Wolf of the SS and what else is there? Hitler's Last Train, Gestapo's Last Orgy, Red Knights of the Gestapo, <laughs> Natalie Escape from Hell, <laughs> The Beast in Heat, uh, The Nazi Ca Love Camp 7, Nazi Love Camp 27, Deported Women of the SS Special Section. Um, <laughs> Hold on. I think there's some other ones in there. What was that? <laughs> that the love camp. It, I love how it's somewhat reminiscent of Love Potion Number Nine. What was that? <laughs> love Camp Number Twenty. I don't really understand those films. Um, I they were just called Nazi Love Camp. I think they had like different titles. Like so, like some of those movies might have been the same movie with different n names. Yeah. Um, but they did like I know there's seven and then there's twenty seven. I don't know if there's like one to six and then. Uh, 8 to 26. I think the numbers aren't, like, sequential. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, those movies, those were all about torture. and But they were also about the nudity. You know, it was a very different sort of, you know, ethos. And, you know, I think following that sort of, like, change was sort of part of the 9-11 ethos, you know? Like, popular depictions of torture shifted from being, you know, like a Viet Cong soldier making a bunch of like POWs like play Russian roulette or something. It's like that. Those were like the popular scenes of torture that you would see like when I was a kid. And then that sort of shifted into like the square jawed pragmatic American hero just doing what needs to be done. Yeah. But at the same time, you have stuff like John Ashcroft. When he was the attorney general, he wanted to drape the uh, Statue of Justice because she had an exposed breast. Yeah, I remember that. And that breast, coincidentally, symbolizes liberty and, like, the republic. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, isn't that, like, that's more of, like, a French symbol, right? Isn't there that, what's that painting of that woman carrying the French flag and her bosom is out? I, I could have told you the name of that until you asked me. <laughs> 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 now that you've asked me, I will, I'll never be able to remember it. But, but I mean, American uh, iconography borrows a lot, you know, from the French Revolution. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, by like early 2000s or whatever and continuing to now, heroic scenes of graphic torture, good, bush hair, bad. Mm -hmm. And cinematic nudity has been in a steady decline since. So, and I've got some data here, you know, because this was something I kind of felt was just true. And I wanted to make sure that like there was some data to back it up. So I went on IMDb. <laughs> so, you know, I guess take it with a grain of salt. That must be like the best source for gathering data on this. I mean, like, I mean, I think it, I think it gives us a, uh, a picture of what I'm talking about. It's not academic. You couldn't take this and write a study on it, but I think it probably does reveal something in what I've done. So here's my methodology. I search for feature films by decade, beginning with the seventies, right up to this year. First, I just looked up the number of films overall, and then. I looked up feature films with the keyword female full frontal nudity. All right. And with the keyword male frontal nudity. So, and here's what I found. So starting in the 1970s, from 1970 to 1979, IMDb shows uh, 36,873 feature films. Now of those 36,800 and some odd films, 1,378 featured female full frontal nudity and 536 featured male frontal nudity. Mm -hmm. So I did the math. Of feature films, 4% mm -hmm. of them in the 1970s featured female full frontal nudity, and 1.4% featured male frontal nudity. That checks out. And, you know, it kind of backs up what I felt, that you see more female full frontal nudity than male frontal nudity. It's not just my viewer bias. It's a thing. Yeah. Then in 1980, uh, the 1980s, you have 39,933 feature films made. So just shy of 40,000 films. So there's more films. There's less nudity 
So in terms of uh, female full frontal nudity, there's uh, 1,217 films with full frontal nudity of females and 564 for the men. So that's in the 1980s, 3% now of films featured female full frontal nudity and 1.4% featured male. So it pretty much held steady for the men, dropped a full percent for the women. And then I'm just going to round up these numbers to make them a little bit easier to, to yeah. say. So in uh, the 90s, there was about 44,000 films made. 1,050 featured female full frontal nudity. 653 featured male full frontal nudity. So there's a decline in the overall number of films each decade of female frontal nudity so far, and an increase of male full frontal nudity. So women are down around 2.4% of films and men are up to 1.5% of films in the 90s. Then in the 2000s, there are 74,700 films made. So like almost double the amount of films that are made, which has to be due to digital film. Wait, in what decade is that? 2000s? 2000 to 2009. Probably also more countries making films too that are yeah. released and listed on IMDb. Yeah. Also DVD market. I mean, there was the VHS market was pretty big, but I think that DVDs were cheaper to produce. So probably in the later half of that decade, you had a larger amount being produced and sold digitally or onto CD. Yeah. So I, you know, there's a lot of factors. So I think the numbers, once you get to the 2000s, are maybe like a little bit less reliable just because mm -hmm. there's way more movies. There's probably way fewer movies where people are actually entering keywords as a percentage of the movies. But anyway, you have... 1,230 films featuring female full frontal nudity. So that's more overall, but it's significantly less as a percentage. And for the men, it's 1,144 films. So it's a significant increase, and it's a slight increase as a percentage. So women go down to 1.6% of films in the 2000s, in the, like 2000 to 2009, and uh, the men go up to 1.53% of films being made. And then from 2010 to 2019, it's even... A bigger increase so now there's 162,000 films being made in that decade which is like more than double there's more nudity again so there's uh, 1737 female full frontal nudity films and 1684 uh, male so that's uh 1.07 percent of films in the like 2010, 2019, have female full frontal nudity, and 1.03 have uh, male frontal nudity. So they're only like 0.04% away from each other at this point. Whereas, whereas it started, they were like 3% away. Yeah, here's some feedback. This is a peer review process. I think what you need to do, really, is go back through all of this data and then set budgets for the films. Because I, I wonder if, I mean, like you, you go with feature length film and in the seventies that like that sets the bar, there's a barrier to entry. Right. But then in the two thousands and certainly the 2010s, that barrier to entry gets lowered significantly. So what's getting called a feature film and what is being included on IMDb is like shit. I agree that the numbers, especially I think from about 2000 on when there's that big jump, I think the numbers are much less clear and able to be uh, deciphered in a way that's like not haphazard. You know, like I think it's it's harder to gleam good data during, yeah. you know, the 2000 to now just because of the number of films that there are. But, you know, also in the 70s, like there were there were probably more, you know, shoestring budget films being produced because you know imdb is listing pornos like especially in the 70s yeah you know, like deep oh on yeah there. um behind the green door and beyond there you know like yeah. uh so i just want to mention why i started in the 70s uh and that's because in the 30s the hollywood studios implemented the hayes code which is also known as the production code. It was basically like the Comics Code Authority, but like 20 or 30 years earlier, and it was for movies. And it imposed a sort of strict moral guidelines for what you could show in films. And like the Comics Code Authority, you know, it gets chipped away at bit by bit over the decades. And so you, first you get these kind of like early exploitation films that would use like the pretense of education to slip nudity in. So you get things like Mom and Dad in 1945, which is like you know, warning about the dangers of teenage sex. And they show like graphic depictions of venereal diseases and uh, they show a live birth. To what end? 
to what end that people went to see it. It was like the third highest grossing film of the year <laughs> by some accounts. And it's because there was just such a taboo and there was such a restriction that people were just starved for like anything that kind of like referenced sex or talked about sex. So it's like you just have to go. And it would kind of like travel around like at that time. It's like you, it was like a traveling kind of show. That's why it's kind of hard to tell for sure exactly how much money it made, you know, because it yeah. wasn't like through the studio system. So, th you know, that's kind of how you got, got away with it, uh, with these sort of like educational films. So things like marijuana, spelled with an H, or mm. sex madness, uh, child bride, you know, and there's sort of like these sort of rakes progress stories, you know, like reefer madness or whatever, where it's like, you know, you watch the downfall of a young person into the underground world of lurid sex, drugs, and alcohol, you know, ostensibly as a warning, but you know, really just because people want to see this stuff depicted. Yeah. Then in the fifties, you get this wave of nudist films. You know, because nudism, it's not a perversion, it's a lifestyle. So you were allowed to show nudity and, and nudism, as, you know, as long as there was like a strategically placed beach ball over the groin area, you yeah. know, you could have TNA. I just want to go on record. I, nudism is a perversion. I disagree. <laughs> You've never been to a nude beach? <laughs> no way, man. Oh, man, it's the best. I love it. It's totally cool, you know? Like, it's Wait not, a second. Uh, hey, I want you... Oh, stand up real quick. Are you wearing pants right now? <laughs> Look, I'm not going to stand up. Um, but it's not because I'm not wearing pants. It's because I'm wearing pajama pants. And I don't want you to know. All right. <laughs> so, you know, there's all these nudist films where it's like this bumbling guy, like a comedian with a guitar or something. And he kind of like falls into like a nudist colony where he meets a bunch of these sort of like glorious Amazon nudist women and kind of learns like how great the nudist lifestyle is you know so there's a whole like series of films like this there's diary of a nudist blaze star goes nudist uh my bear lady stop it that's no, not that's the one of, so there's a whole bunch i think i might have that one uh maybe i'll send it to you then as the 60s go on the nudist film story structure gets adapted into these films called the nudie cuties where like the pretense of nudism is dropped it's the same sort of thing like a bumbling guy bumps into a whole bunch of naked women basically you know just tna but uh there's a whole bunch of them like nude on the moon the adventures of lucky pierre or uh, orgy of the dead which is uh ed, ed wood wrote that one um and russ meyer he's like the biggest name to come out of this sort of genre and then that leads into the roughies which are like similar uh, in terms of the amount of nudity but they're more like uh like film noir and they have like violence and crime and lesbianism and white slavery and sex cults and stuff like that and uh, these would play in the early grindhouse theaters and sort of while this progression of cinematic nudity is going on the mpaa is basically struggling to remain relevant until it eventually abandons the code completely in favor of their rating system in 1967, you, you know, which is more or less continues today. You know, that's the one that you see G, P, G, yeah. R, X. There's some other ones. And uh, that lifted the restrictions of screening this stuff. And so that's where you get to this interesting intersection of regular porn and cinema. So you have like the Black Emanuel films. Some of those have hardcore scenes, but most of them do not. Or at least they have cuts where they do not. Maybe in different markets they do. Um, but, uh, you know, so you have this sort of thing. You have like Deep Throat becomes this big, like, cultural moment. People rush out to see it, you know, with their wives or whatever. Caligula. Caligula, for sure. That's that's a film, I think, that also had some hardcore scenes as well that aren't like... I think that, that story isn't as straightforward, though. I think there was like some... There was some shot after. Well, there's yeah. also Caligula 2, which I believe is a porno. And then there's like Caligula and Messalina. And then I think there's also Caligula's Love Slaves. I think that's another one too. There's a few Caligula films. I'm, I'm a Caligula purist. So are you just like yeah, Caligula? It's just the first one. So in the 1970s, full frontal nudity was still fairly novel. So I think a loss of novelty is one reason that you sort of see a decline in nudity sort of steadily over the years is that it's not as interesting, I guess because, you know, we've all seen it. And uh, another is just capitalism, right? Like, 
you know, you can, the fewer audiences you can pitch your film to, the less potential revenue you can make. And then this is especially true with like opening up international markets that are actually becoming dominant. Uh, and so you get this sort of phenomenon of like the de-sexed Marvel film, you know, things like that. And uh, I also think there's a psychological component as well, especially in like America. Like there's a fear of sexuality tied to various moral panics that are going on, which we see played out in things like banning mouse or, you know, the anti-drag queen laws, or most recently the uh, Michelangelo uh, statue of David. You know, there's some outrage over that recently. Because his wiener's too small. Well, he's scared, right? <laughs> you know, you you wouldn't be you wouldn't be showing, you know, if you were going up against Goliath. And uh, you know, but that was like literally a joke thirty years ago on The Simpsons. Is it a masterpiece or just some guy with his pants down? You know, now yeah. it's like reality. Uh, and then you see the sort of the same thing in the more censorious corners of the left, where you have debates about like displays of sexuality at pride parades or the anti-porn rhetoric or like you know even like in recent months there's been like these sort of inexplicable defenses of the Hayes code and the comics code authority and stuff like that where people are sort of coming around saying like well you know it was pretty nice not uh you know not every uh movie was full of sex you know which is like overlooks like how awful those systems were and like how oppressive they were <laughs> what's funny is i think at a recent show i said i think <laughs> I think I said something in defense of the Comics Code Authority. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have no respect for the Comics Code Authority, but I do agree that comics were like advertising to kids in the most gratuitous and offensive ways. And, you know, that probably should have been reined in some way. But like, I think the code was like, that was like social engineering, you know, like it was really messed up, you know, especially some of the stuff you could, couldn't show, like you had to have respect for cops and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. All sorts of stuff. And the same thing with the Hayes Code, right? Like, that's where it's like, all of a sudden, every movie couple sleeps in two separate beds. So anyway, here's how I feel about it. You know, I'm a bit of a reactionary on this issue. Uh, and I'd like to see us as a society back up around the 3% mark <laughs> in terms of nudity. And when it comes to the narrowing of the Bush to Dong gap. Yeah, uh, BTD. I'm all for it. You know, I'm a feminist. Free the peen. I can get behind that. You know, I just want to see more nudity in cinema overall, you know, of all stripes, you know, and I think there's room for more sex in cinema. What are your thoughts? <laughs> I I think it's fine how it is right now. It's getting worse. It's a slippery slope. <laughs> well, th this is the other thought that I had is that, you know, you have um, shows on HBO, right, that rely. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say rely because they're like really well received critically. Um, there's no reliance on on nudity, but that's something where it's like almost every HBO show has some form of nudity in it, right? And a lot of those like kind of high end television series, like that seems to be how that how they mark themselves as being prestige. Yeah, a prestige thing where it's like yes, we have we we'll, we show the the human form, the naughty bits. Yeah, it's a distinction from network television or whatever yeah um and Look. i agree and um i think tv i'm sure you could do this search for tv and you would definitely find like a massive uptick in nudity on tv i recently watched game of thrones i had never seen it i've never seen it i was surprised at how much gratuitous nudity was in it like every episode i think i think there's a different sort of story there you know tv and cinema have kind of they've kind of merged right because now when you go to the movies it's all digital and so it's the same picture that you get on your TV at home. It's not film, right? Like, yeah. And so, like, TV has become like film. You know, our TVs have become huge and high def. You know, the programming has become more cinematic in terms of nudity. Budgets are a lot higher. Well, that's it, yeah. And uh, I guess in that market, it's like nudity draws them in. But the cinema, it doesn't work. I don't know. But uh, I miss it. I like to see a little more. Not a ton more, but, you know, I, I feel like the downward trend is like, I find it somewhat alarming. You know, I feel like there's like a de-sexing of like popular media and, uh, you know, sex and nudity. It's like, that's a big part of life, you know? Yeah. Like you might not know this about me, but under my clothes, I'm naked right now. Uh, ew. I know. I know. <laughs> it's a lifestyle, bro.
Well, here we are at the Wordly Desires department. And we have each picked five publications that we could create if money, time, reality was no object, what would we assemble into books, periodicals, or uh, some type of medium that could be published and distributed out to people like us? And even better, if someone else made it so we could just read it and not have to do any of the work. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I roped us into it. <laughs> yeah, I was worried for a second there. I was like, oh, man, we're already doing a podcast? Like, geez, what do you want from me? I could barely do this. <laughs> hey, we're almost up to episode two. All right. <laughs> so we came up with rules for this. So these are books that we wish existed, no matter the cost. It could be a regular book, a comic book, a series of comics, a magazine, whatever, a publication. To the best of our knowledge, these have to be books or series that don't already exist, or at least that are extremely obscure, like they're self-published, or it was like a small run done years ago, or it's in a different language. Um, three, it has to be theoretically possible. So you could say Kit Lively and Dave DeGrand do a Batman run, but you couldn't say Dave Berg does a Batman mm -hmm. run because he's dead. Rule number four is no smoking. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just not healthy and it probably messes with the equipment. All right. So, well, let's kick it off uh, with number five. So my pick for number five, I'd like to see a series of cracked magazine archives so like you know you could do the best of ward the best of severin the best of davis the best of orheck the best of close you know you could do collections of nanny dickering interviews or their comic book parodies or you know ditko's robots mm -hmm. you know there's all kinds of things that you could do with that and it doesn't exist there's like basically no cracked books put out except for like mort todd did too he did too he reprinted the best of severin and the best mm. of davis but those were just issues of cracked that he reprinted from the actual issues god love them i have those books they're better than nothing but you know it really does hurt the artwork when you have to take it from the the printed version you know there's already like some degradation it's a copy of a copy yeah yeah absolutely it is uh those ones are lacking so in your mind this is like taking the original artwork right like well that's the problem from... And that's why this will probably never happen because Cracked was in the American media building in 2001 when the anthrax scare happened just after 9-11. And uh, so someone anonymously mailed a letter containing anthrax and someone died. And uh, as a result of the evacuation, all of Cracked's photographic prints of the originals were destroyed due to contamination. So they don't exist. Mm. Unless there's like copies somewhere, you can you can find the issues and you can scan the pages from that. But you know it, it doesn't exist. Like there'll never be like an artist edition or anything. Maybe you can track down some originals or something. But yeah. But you know it. I think it's like there could be AI scanning technology where they can kind of like maybe eventually do resizing of zipatone and like different kinds of like half tones. Yeah. But that is, that's my number five that I'd like to see is some, some really high quality cracked books. I like that. And I feel somewhat ashamed. Cracked never even entered my mind. Well, it shows a lot about who you are as a person. And my number five would be a, um, a collection of Tintin. Okay. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got okay. one on my shelf right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it sucks. All right, let me tell you. Yeah, it's not very good. It's one of two things. It's either there was like this uh, slipcase uh, collection of 23 issues. Now, those Tintin heads will be like, wait, it's 24, right? Tintin in the Congo. Oh, that hasn't been reprinted. I can imagine why. They've stopped reprinting it. So is that the only one you want? or <laughs> 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 You have the rest. You just need that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My... my ideal Tintin collection is 24 issues of Tintin in the Congo. How would they be printed? Would it be like back to front? Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, so that's your option. You, you have like the, the slip jacketed ones where they're like the soft back ones. You can just buy at Barnes and Noble or whatever yeah. goofball Canadian book distributor you guys have. Like it's called chapters here. Chapters. Okay. Yeah, I, was books, gonna, eh? I would call it books. <laughs> that's what... <laughs> It's called a boot books. <laughs> they have these um, 
again, they have hardcover ones that are in a, in a nice slip case. They had two yeah. versions, one with all 24 issues, the other with 23, but they're smaller. And to me, th that, like, you lose something. And they're probably recolored as well. I think they're re and I think they're re-lettered, too. So what I would ask is that you look at something like the Calvin and Hobbes Essential Collection. I bought that mm -hmm. for my daughter for Christmas. It's three hardbound volumes, fabric covered in this beautiful case. You take them out. You do that with those. You have to do like eight issues in each one. It'd be huge. You'd need a book stand to read it. But, oh, I want it so badly. I was in uh, Paris 10, 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, the comic stores there are amazing. Um, and I remember going into one and uh, they had like a huge collection of like Tintin just right there. Like basically what you're saying, like all, like every beautiful collection, giant books, like all sorts of ways. And interestingly enough, they were right next to all the Milo Monera <laughs> collection. So it's like, I don't you know, know talk Milo about, a, oh, you don't know Milo Monera? He's like a kind of an erotic artist. I, you would call him an erotic artist for sure. Oh, he he's like the one Flick, that... Butterscotch. He did that, that cover. Spider Woman of, cover. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a sick cover he's highly respected as like an artist uh, specifically for his paintings of nude women so i nice. that was kind of a culture shock to me you know going in there and being like wow here's all the tin tin right next to all the tits you know <laughs> like, yeah and it's like that's you know I, that's where i think we should go i what i was talking about earlier <laughs> <laughs> all right here we go number four there was quite a few european artists that I'd love to see English editions from Prashard, Gottlieb, Alexis, Zanzim, Blachon, Soleil. You know, so I just wanted to pick one for this list so it wouldn't be all European artists. Yeah, those names uh, mean nothing to me. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> the one I went with, he's a Swedish artist, Hans Arnold. And I actually have some examples of his work here to show you. So um, he died in 2010, 1920 to 2010. And, you know, he just has oh, wow. this really like detailed style of drawing. Uh, it's very charming. That's beautiful. Great scale. Like everything about it is beautiful. They're beautiful drawings, but they're also fun. They have this kind of macabre component to them. And uh, he did a tarot deck. This isn't from a tarot deck. This is ABBA. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he's, he's kind of cheeky. This is from, from The Hobbit. Yeah. So I have one book of his in English. I think this is the only one like I, I found was Monsterland, which like this book is great, but he's got a ton of work, especially his adult work. I think I've seen me. that, that Monsterland. That looks familiar to me. Those, those images that you showed though, it's like, he looks a bit like Edward Gorey. He has a bit of that kind of vibe. That's what I was going to say. Absolutely. Yeah. But it also, the, the other thing is it's so quintessentially seventies. Like I feel like I've seen his style. Like he must've informed a lot of other artists, right? I mean, well, I think a lot of his stuff is floating around. Like I think he was doing illustration in the Western market as well, or like his illustrations were sort of like seeping into it, or maybe yeah. there's a bunch of other American artists that look like his, but he's someone who I've always been kind of fascinated with his work whenever I've seen it. And there's so little of it. So definitely like a big uh, Hans Arnold collection. That's yeah, what that's like super cool. And, wait, and before I share my next one, am I crazy when I look at his artwork to also make a link to Maurice Sendak? No, I could see that as well. He has that kind of sensibility. I think that ties into that sort of 70s look. Yeah. Um, there's something about it where it's kind of like a little psychedelic but still a little like sort of 1950s illustration style is kind of still like under the surface a bit. And it's, it's a little creepy, you know, like even like something like schoolhouse rock or something like that, you can even yeah. see the kind of like line work kind of creeping in yeah. to like all of this stuff from that period. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. If you ever go to the website, monster brains, mm -hmm. the blog, phenomenal blog, it's been going for like, I think more than a decade. Uh, great huge scans of like monsters you can find like big screens of them, make up your computer background oh uh, dude i'll do that yeah i go check it out monster brains um yeah. it's a blog so it won't last much longer <laughs> all right so for my number four this is also an artist from the 1970s he has a lot of books floating around but i don't know if it's exactly what i want he is a pretty big departure from the art style of mr arnold but it is ralph steadman I have this book, uh, Ralph Steadman, America, 
and it's a collection. It's like a paperback. It's kind of an odd, it's almost like 11 by 17 turned sideways, but it's all the work that he did for Rolling Stone with Hunter S. Thompson. And I, I love it. It's not so much about him. It'll give like a brief synopsis about, you know, what this art was appearing with as far as like writing, uh, like what article in Rolling Stones it appeared beside. But I want, I want that for a larger collection of his work. Like his other work. Yeah. And he has a lot of other work. Like he's most famously known for his work with Hunter S. Thompson, the imagery that he created for Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas in particular, I think is one that people really, really know. But he has a pretty wide breadth of work. And I think it would be yeah. cool if somebody made a, a large coffee table book, like showing all of his, not all of his work, but like that breadth of work. The one that I found seems more like biographical mm -hmm. than what I'm looking for exactly. I don't own it, so maybe somebody will correct me, but that's what I want. I feel like he's faded a bit from the cultural imagination because I, I know I've seen that book before. Mm -hmm. And so it probably came out in like the 90s or early 2000s, I would guess. Which one? The, 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 the one that you're in... talking about, His America. Oh, yeah, I think that may have been in the 90s. I don't know. I don't think he's as as recognized by like you know younger generations and stuff in fact i actually saw i'm in a simpsons group on facebook and someone posted recently like the scene from from the simpsons where they're doing like a parody of like dr gonzo and uh his lawyer in the car that sure was a fun trip to las vegas uh too many kids and someone posting like oh, i just found out this is from a movie <laughs> 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 and then people are tuning in like, no, that's by Hunter S. Thompson. He drew that. Yeah. You know, so he's not a household name anymore, I don't think, or at least not as much. That's I've, I've come across that too, where people seem to think that it was Hunter S. Thompson that did the illustrations. And it's really a shame, like, because Hunter S. Thompson is not an artist. He's an artist as a writer, but not, you know, with pen and ink. And Ralph Steadman, I've always really liked his stuff because there was this sort of like, it's this wild movements these marks that are just like seem chaotic but there's a real level of talent there there's a lot of structure a lot of structure like i think of his stuff i think of really clean lines parallel lines like you know look like they're drawn with a ruler or whatever you know very constructed and then this sort of like sheen of messiness yeah and it doesn't betray the art because it's a big part of it, but it, I think it does like sort of give the impression that it's just kind of like a scribble or whatever, when clearly it's like a very worked drawing. Yeah. I don't even know how he's working. Were they lithographs or something? I don't know how he worked. I, I, I don't know that much about it, but he sort of reminds me, or I guess like Frank Miller sometimes reminds me of Ralph Steadman when Frank will kind of go wild and work just with blacks and like some of his drawings are just sort of like not quite right but it works because he has like an underlying knowledge about you know anatomy and um what is that when you set up a scene like a structure composition, composition yeah. yeah because he has that knowledge like he can break those rules a little bit more and that's the same with ralph steadman it's like why does this work it looks like just splatters and scribbles on top of geometric patterns or like sharp lines but it has kind of a logic to it like the way he structures his his world it's like it's expressive of you know emotion and yeah. the personality of the characters is sort of brought out in the way that he depicts them rather than just like a straightforward depiction. it's gonzo art really like it kind of fits in like it's about telling a good story and love about like you know being in the moment but it's like it's very very disciplined at the same time he's a very interesting artist absolutely all right what what number are we on number three complete crumb volume 18 and up so I don't know if you're familiar with The Complete Crumb. I am not. Fantagraphics has put out this series. It's 17 volumes. I have them all right here. That basically tracks Robert Crumb's work from a teenager. So it's stuff he was doing in zines, like ripping off Mad Magazine, up until 1989. And then it stops. And it's most of everything. Like the, the, uh, the Yum Yum book isn't in there because his first wife owns a copyright on that. So if you want to own the complete crumb, you have to own that separately. And there's a few things that, you know, Fantagraphics missed. But it's 
very convenient in terms of collecting crumb but it stops there so it misses like half of his work for weirdo it misses like three issues of zap that came after it misses all of hup all of mystic funnies genesis of course isn't there i feel like genesis you could leave out yeah um, that's like a standalone thing yeah yeah I, I don't think it would work in that series but uh and then since then he hasn't done as much in terms of comics but he's done a bit uh there's definitely some like dirty laundry stuff they did with his wife uh aileen who passed away a few months ago and uh, it just stops and so the idea at the time as, as the complete crumb was being published crumb was doing hop for last gasp and the complete crumb was being published by fantagraphics so the idea was you stop at hop because you don't want to sort of undermine the sale of this other comic book and then i think the sort of idea was it maybe pick up later on but then yeah. the movie came out crumb became like even more famous and now it's like fantagraphics doesn't really put out crumb books anymore he gets put out by these like obscure french publishers doing like these high-end editions and mm. it just never got picked up so it just stops and it misses like you know it needs at least three more volumes to have like what i call the canonical crumb yeah which is the big yum yum book the complete crumb the weirdo years zap hop mystic funnies and a bit of dirty laundry I say that in my Chrome videos. So it's missing a lot of that. And it would be nice if it was in one book. Yeah. And so that is definitely had to be on my list. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I have a question about like the, because he's like living in France now, right? Is that like yeah, a big part yeah. of it? Is just like, I mean, is it that Fantagraphics can't afford him or is it just like he's just. I think working? there's a lot of, a lot of factors. There's a huge, there's a lot of controversy around publishing Chrome yeah. for one. So it's like, I think a lot of American publishers don't want to touch them, maybe even Fantagraphics included, I don't know. But then I think it's also just like the money is like there. Yeah. So it's like the most recent book I have is, it's like the complete comic covers that was put yeah. out by this, I think a French company. And it's like a really expensive, it was a hundred bucks. And it's like, that's how he's publishing now. And he makes most of his money off of the sale of original art. So, I mean, I guess he yeah. just doesn't care enough to like publish. It's not like he's directing his own publishing. He's just like making money, and listen to records. Yeah. All right. But yeah, that's definitely on my list. I would, I just wish it continued because I have all these floppy comics. I don't like really like fl having floppy comics and I yeah. got to have a stack of them because it's the only way you can get it all together. And it's a pain in the ass. I think to be honest, you've, you've got me turned around on floppy comics because <laughs> i got I, mean, I got so many boxes of comics and i'm like shit maybe i do need to just own books of these so for the listeners uh patrick and i we kind of differ uh substantially as collectors in that i pretty much exclusively collect books and collections of things that i want to read and i i hate having to have like floppy like comics and boards and bags are so inconvenient they're oh, hard yeah. to get out when you want to look at them. Mm -hmm. um, they're hard to find when you want to look at them. Yes. And I just end up not looking at them and they just collect dust. And it's like, I want, I want like a living library of books that I can just pull up. But Patrick, he's got this sort of like fetish obsession with like the original thing. And he just wants to like get his greedy little fingers on it and <laughs> have it so no one else can have it. And it's like, it's like some sort of creepy perversion that he has basically. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and all of those things, all of those drawbacks you listed are 100% accurate. Um, yeah. So much so that actually, I'm just going to shoehorn this. And one of mine that I wrote down was um, John Carter of Warlord of Mars, the Marvel series. Um, okay. I went out because I got obsessed with John Carter and bought all of the floppy issues from the 70s including the annuals, kind of fun. I think it's issue 28 or 18, I forget. Um, Frank Miller makes his first appearance published uh, in Marvel in John Carter, Warlord of Mars. But I wanted that in a collection because I want to read it again, but I don't yeah. want to pull out all the floppy <laughs> issues. Well, that's it. Like, you have to be so precious, too. Like, when you get into, like, older stuff, like, because like, I won't lie, there is a presence there. Like, you know, if there was, like, a, like a nice copy of like whatever mad number eight or something in front of me yeah like it would be a joy to look through that you know i do i like there there would definitely be a presence i would have like total veneration for the object but i don't know i mean i use my mad archives like weekly yeah <laughs> you know like i pull it off my shelf and i look at it all the time 
And that's just how I like my books. I like if I have a momentary thought that I want to look at something, I want to be able to get it and look at it and, you know. There's no real defense of having floppies. It's, it's all emotional. It's all that's Well, I think I'm probably deluding myself too because there's a lot of emotional attachment for me too, but you know, it's to the work and seeing the work. Yeah. I don't know, just something about books. I I go for books. Anyway, I, I don't all mean right. to make fun of you. Over yeah, like, no, I, I don't I get all. like the idea of having the original thing and like how, yeah. how neat that is, but I just don't have room for it. All right. So my number three is my favorite mad cover artist. I think most people's favorite mad cover artist, no offense to any of the Sam others. Sam Viviano. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Norman Mingo. Norman Mingo was like the second regular contributor for covers. Kelly Freeze was, well, okay. If you go back to the comics, Harvey Kurtzman, then Kelly Freeze took over shortly after it. It became a magazine. And then Norman Mingo was like the guy for, it seems like decades. And I thought it would be really cool to have a, an artist edition of mad covers. So you track down all of that original artwork you go to high quality scans and you compile a book so you can see it as the artist created it you know leaving you know the space for the the mad logo or for whatever other things need to be added but you just get his beautiful paintings untouched on your table i i mean that would be that would be a, a beautiful thing I don't know if Mingo is my favorite. I don't think of Mingo very well, often. I just, because I'm I feel sorry, like... Kyle. Well, I, ju I, just, I just said it's everybody's favorite. <laughs> so, you, well, you, you said gotta... accepting Harvey Kurtzman, who, you know, basically that should be the caveat before anything you say about that. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, well, obviously Kurtzman's at the top. But um, I don't know. I just, I always, like, obviously his artwork's gorgeous but i feel like he's kind of like uh he was like an idiot savant right because he's like this guy who he wasn't like a comedy guy no he was an illustration guy he was like norman rockwell type illustration guy yeah tons of ads ads with these like beautiful women like wearing dresses or like i don't know putting on pantyhose or something i was looking yeah. through it when i was doing research for this he's such a beautiful painter it's yeah, unreal he's, he's phenomenal he's phenomenal but he had he had good comedic chops right like like a lot of his covers are are really funny. I can't think of which ones it would be specifically, other than like the the only one that like number ninety immediately. Uh, what's, what's number ninety? Binks Donuts. That's my favorite cover. <laughs> I prefer the cracked uh, square version of that. <laughs> no, Finks Donuts. That's a good one. That is a good one. Yeah, and you know he probably did most of the ones where it's like a really nice looking Alfred. But I don't know. I mean, I always look forward to the the weird ones, you know, like like whenever Sergio would do a cover or like I think Caldwell did a cover at one point. Yeah, he did it. Well, he did the 9-11 cover. Oh, did he do that one? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they ended up. Well, they pulled it because it was right after 9-11 and there was a dead <laughs> man on the street of New York City. But he did it before 9-11. Yeah, 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 yeah. He wasn't like, well, here's our 9-11 <laughs> memorial. <laughs> Okay, so here's my question about your book. Would yeah. there just be Mad covers, or would it be his other work as well? Originally, I was thinking just his Mad covers, but it would be cool to... I mean, I don't really know that much about him. So, like, have a couple pages, a little biography. Uh, some of his other work before he got into Mad, I think, would be cool. It would be able to, like, a comparative, you know, look. Well, let's expand your idea here, and let's say a series of Norman Mingo coffee table books collecting his work and celebrating his life because that certainly doesn't exist like i feel like he's like outside of mad circles i couldn't imagine like very many people know who he is if... no it, it's like it would be like saying the name norman saunders to somebody unless you care about mars attacks you're not going to know who that is yeah i didn't know who that was and i like yeah, he's mars a, attacks he's a guy who painted <laughs> all the mars attacks he was this pulp artist from minnesota and you know, it's like nobody knows who he is, but he had like this huge cultural impact because of his work on Mars Attacks. I have a few. I, I have a few good illustrator books like that. Um, what's the one? It's called. Oh, what's it called? Sex and. Of course, it has to do with sex. Sex and horror. Have you talked to a doctor? It's Italian illustrators that are yeah. doing like these sort of like Jallo posters and like horror artwork covers for magazines, pulp magazines and books. Yeah. And I just eat that stuff up. Any kind of pulp 
illustration. I just eat that up. I love it. So yeah, yeah, I would love to see that. Number two. All right. So inspired by Crumb's Genesis, this isn't a Crumb suggestion, but this is continuing on Crumb's work. I want to see the rest of the Bible illustrated by prestige artists who you wouldn't expect to do it, who draws it straightforward as like an illustration project, you know, just draws what's in the text. If you've read Crumb's Genesis, you know what I mean? It's like, there's yeah. not a lot of editorializing by the artist. So, you know, it could be Sergio Aragones, it could be Charles Burns, Dan Klaus, Jim Woodring, uh, Robert Williams, you know, anyone think of like, you know, the biggest artists that you can, but like who you would not expect to do the Bible, right? Like it has yeah. to be someone who's like, isn't an obvious choice. Maybe you could even get crazy, get like Junji Ito doing like revelations or something, you know, like that horror artist that you see around doing yeah. manga or something, you know, like money no, is no object and you go, everyone gets a book and you have like five years to make it. Here's like however much it costs us to get you to spend five years making this thing. Or you could do it like break it up into chapters and say, yeah, because Crumb you... did all of Genesis, but you could do like up to like the end of the Garden of Eden and then switch to another artist or something because there's kind of story arcs within the Bible. Yeah, well, there's like the narrative ones and then there's like, would you include things like uh, Deuteronomy? Like where it's nothing just like, left out. There could be nothing left out. Nothing so, left out. So no, you're doing no. so okay, but I mean like some of that stuff is like just rules. We know he'd be good for that chapter. Robert Sikoriak would be awesome for that chapter. He did a book that was the terms and conditions of I think iTunes. Okay. He did like a whole comic of that. He did a comic of the U.S. Constitution. Um, I actually got to draw with him at a comics jam when I was like 18. He's a really interesting artist because he's a copier. He, and even there when he was at the jam, he would like open up like a comic that had like Batman and he would draw it like pretty much exactly like it. And he sort of, his main thing was in Raw Magazine, retold classic literature using different comic characters. So he did Genesis using Blondie and Dagwood. Yeah. He did... Uh, my personal favorite was Dante's Inferno with Bazooka Joe comics. And they're great. You know, it tells the yeah. whole kind of story, and but it uses the tropes and that exact style. And he's like a, an amazing copier. He used to work for SpongeBob comics. I used to read those when I worked at the newsstand. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome artist. He would be perfect for something like that. I, I mean, I'd love the idea. <laughs> I, I really Have you do. read Crumb's Genesis? Yeah, I own it. Yeah. So, I mean, he have got the section where it's all begats and stuff. So, you know, he makes it interesting. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, I love whenever I see any comic version of the Bible, I will I'll purchase it. I mean, if it's Me by too. somebody who met not like they sell this one at Hobby Lobby where it's like it it's just shit. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. It's just like a trashy comic of the Bible, and it's not. Yeah, it's just meant to like sell to like Christian grandmas who will buy anything Christian for their kids or for yeah. their grandkids or whatever. It's just schlock, but not like the good kind of schlock from like the '50s or something. <laughs> But like Kubert's Bible stories, there's like a thing where it's like a Time Life magazine size comic that DC put out of Bible stories. It's sick, dude. Yeah. So I don't know what chapter Noah Van Skyver would get, but I think he, he'd have to get one. Oh, what would he be good at? I don't know. Let's give him let's give him Deuteronomy. He can... <laughs> no, I'm giving him second Maccabees. That's what I'm going to give him. No, you know, he, he'd be good at like something with Jesus, I think. He'd be good. He'd be a really good New Testament kind of guy. One of the early sort of stories of Christ where it's not a lot of magic in it, you know. He can basically give it the, the Mormon treatment. Even better, because they would pay him a lot more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. What is my number two? A collection. A collection of a uh, recurring Mad Magazine character. And that is Monroe by Tony Barbietti. I probably fucked up his name. And uh, illustrated by uh, Bill Ray. Or William Ray, as he goes by now. A complete collection of monroe so that does include things that were not drawn by bill he leaves mad magazine and somebody else picks it up but i do think oh, really that i didn't know that monroe continued after he left yes yes and it was not as good visually but i think the the person did a fine job it didn't really work as well for me johnny sampson he, he could pull it off i think maybe no what a Monroe? It, it, it would look different, though. It would have to look No, totally Johnny Sampson could do something like Spy vs. Spy. He can't do Monroe. I'm sorry. He could do Monroe. I have, a, I have the utmost respect for him. <laughs> but I have to vociferously disagree. All right. Well, Johnny Sampson, when you come on the show, this other goon won't be here. <laughs> Just you and me. And I'll put you up on a pedestal. All right. Well, I'd like to hear his thoughts on it. There we go. 
Or we can um, bring him on and do a good cop, bad cop kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so here, one of the reasons I want to get back to Monroe real quick because oh, like, yeah. when, it's one of like the few things in Mad that had like an ongoing narrative. Like they had some stories that were like two part stories that were very much connected between issues. But even so, like this family, things happened in an issue, like the parents got divorced. And then, you know, a couple of issues later, you see the dad living in some slum. Yeah. It was really unique. And I think that they weren't, they've tried to capture that again later on, but I don't think they were ever able to do that successfully. Well, I would 100% buy that book. And I'd love yeah. to see more Monroe by Ray. You know, I remember Monroe was sort of coming into Mad as I was kind of leaving Mad in the late 90s. Yeah. And so I, I really enjoyed it, but I didn't really see where the story went. You know, I hear from you sort of, you know, how the story sort of evolved. And, uh, you know, it really intrigues me. I'd love to see a Monroe collection. That would be great. Well, the other thing, too, you'll your ears will perk up about this. Like there's like a very sexual part of it, too. That was definitely a, a factor that I liked about it. It was a little more lurid in the way that it sort of dealt with like, you know, white trash. Yeah. And well, and also like puberty for a young man, like he was just this obsessed. And I don't know, I think that that was captured really well in the writing and also in the artwork, like what it feels like to be in the mind of an adolescent. And it's the right demographic too for Mad too, right? Because it's a lot of kids like kind of on the verge of that and adults can relate to it because they went through it. Good yeah. stuff. Yeah, thank you. Runners up. All right. So for me, the complete Goodman Beaver collection featuring Goodman Beaver Goes to Playboy Mansion, which you have. I sent you executive comic book. You did, yeah. Which I kind of regret a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I have another version of it. But then when I looked at it, I was like, oh, this isn't quite as good. But they got sued. So I believe it ran in help i don't know the history really well but i think it ran in help and then i think there was like a cease and desist or something from archie comics oh and so then it wasn't reprinted again in Ooh. like the in the collections right like so it was an executive comic book it was in help and then i think it might have appeared in like a comics journal i think they reprinted it but otherwise it's not in the collection like i have the goodman beaver collection which is great uh, this is like a will elder harvey kurtzman cartoon but the playboy comics missing and uh, the, another one, this one isn't a book or anything, but I guess it's a publication, a poster. I'd like to see a really nice, high-quality version of Boris Vallejo's back cover of Mad Magazine, Mad Cuts the Baloney. Do you know this oh, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where it's a Where's barbarian, it? he's cutting the baloney. <laughs> oh, I love that. I want, like, a big poster of that on my wall. You can't get it. Yeah, that'd be sick. All right, so one of my, I think I actually mentioned a bunch of my runners up, but a Mars Attacks coffee table book. Turns out they do make it, but <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy it. John Pound put it together. Um, my only worry is I, I want, like, I like those books that are, like, obscenely big. I have mm. a book stand that is perfect for books like that. Like, I have, like, a thing of, like, the complete works of Shakespeare, and I can put it on there, and it's huge, but I can read it, and it's wonderful. And I want that for the Mars Attacks cards because I'm trying to collect them all. But how big do you think those those paintings are? Have you seen like an original? Like how big are the? I've never seen an original. I sort of envisioned this as being sort of like fact, like copies, high resolution photographs of the cards themselves, mm -hmm. so that yeah, it that kind work. of captures that part of it. I didn't think about an artist edition. I guess I assumed that none of the art exists anymore. I don't know. I mean. It's probably it's almost certainly not in one place. That's the yeah. that would be the hard part. You'd have to track it down. Yeah. But uh, it would be nice to see even like a card book where it was like a mix of things where you found the original art. Because there was like there's garbage pail kids, there's dinosaurs attacks, there's Mars attacks. Yeah. Other other crazy ones, wacky packages, you know. Yeah. Um, well, John Pound, the guy who worked, um, he did garbage pail kids. He did. He compiled this book. I think he did a little write up for each card. So I got that in my Amazon card. I'm about to buy it. I think. Nice. Is it is it cheap? It's like twenty eight bucks. That's why I don't That's think good. it's what I want. I don't think it's yeah, what it's I want because nice. of that price. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, if it makes you feel better, if it was in Canada, there'd probably be like forty dollars of shipping. <laughs> hey, that, that does make me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Number one. <laughs> Locate, Little Cozy Nostril, At the End of the World. This is my dream book that I'd love to make. Basically a Where's Waldo book, but for my 
flagship character who I don't do anything with other than like a branding logo, Little Cozy Nostril. It wouldn't be for kids, you know, it would be like mature and uh, it would be just like a Waldo book, the full size thing. Wimmel Builder. A Wimmel Builder Bush. That's what it would be. That's what you're looking at me like. I'm, the bush means book. So when you say Wimmel Builder, that means a busy picture. And Wimmel Builder Bush. It might be I thought bush. that was like some Freudian slip. <laughs> Am, I think I, it, it could be a Freudian mispronunciation, but I think it's bush. It's B U, I think S C H. Or it might be S. I can't remember how it's spelled, but yeah. Okay. There's Wimmel Builder and Wimmel Builder Bush or Butch. Yeah. I'm not German. It's just we don't have a word for that. But yeah, a busy picture book, little cozy nostril. This is what I've wanted to draw since I was, you know, nine years old and creating this character. And I think it would be at the end of the world. So it's like every page would be like a different end of the world. So, you know, zombies, 2012, Y2K, you know, Comet, Aliens. Uh, whatever I can think of, you know, but like, it's the kind of thing, it takes Martin Hanford a full month to do a Waldo page. And I bet that's gone up because his, his work's become more dense as he's gotten older. Yeah. So, you know, probably like a month to two months to, months to do a page. So it's like, you need to have all the money up front, basically. Like you need to be able to like, take two years off to make this book or at least a year. And on top of that, then you have to get it published, you know? So yeah. that's my dream book. So that had to be number one for me. Dude, I love that. I love that you picked something for yourself. Yeah. That's <laughs> <Okay>. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Would you hide would you hide like um little personal references? Like um I mean probably, you know, like I'd yeah. put my wife in it or something, you know, like um and she's actually on the beer I'm drinking right now, I don't know if you can see it on here, but like I did put her in there reading a book. Ah, oh, nice, um, dude. Yeah. But, you know, sparingly, you know. I mean, you got a lot of room. It's like you can slip some things in. But mostly, you know, I wouldn't want to waste the space on things that people wouldn't get, you know. Like every moment in one of those drawings is like a moment to, like, entertain. And that's what Martin Hanford does. And that's why he's, like, such a phenomenon. And that's why the Waldo books are so good. Yeah. Is that anywhere you look, there's it's interesting. It's never just, like, people standing around doing nothing. It's yeah. like people... You know, there's action going on. If there's people standing around doing nothing, it's because it's transitioning into something that's happening and something's going to happen to them in a minute. Yeah, they'll, they'll be like standing in line and then either before or after them is some level of chaos that's Yeah, being that's going to reach them, on. you know. Yeah. So when you look at it, you're like, you can you can build these narratives about what's happening. And like, they were just, I loved them so much as a kid and I've always wanted to do one. But it's like, you know, it's the only thing I really love to draw. It's like my favorite thing to draw is just a busy fucking picture. Like as much, fit as much in there as you can. But it's like, who who will pay you to do that? Nobody. Yeah. <laughs> like no one wants to pay like, you know, 400 hours of work or something. Not you know? not like, when we have Martin Hanford. No, well, and I mean, he doesn't do much of it either, really. Like, like Waldo kind of like trailed off. It like it exploded and it had yeah. all this marketing. Like there's a cartoon show and all this like, kind of embarrassing marketing and then it kind of like there's still waldo books but they're not i don't feel like they're they're quite the same as like the first like three i think those were like yeah. the big ones there was where's waldo where's waldo now and i think it's a great waldo search we well, even waldo, waldo hollywood. in hollywood i thought yeah, that hollywood one's good one too that good. it's four books yeah it's four books yeah all right my number one is um mad magazine back nice what it was. nice this is what I imagine, though. It's like, you know, all new material. That's actually false. I think that Mad Magazine did something kind of cool in having the Mad Vault. And every once in a while, they would have in the pages, throw something in from way back when. And yeah. I always appreciated that because it was like, for me, it's like, this is new. Well, presumably, if Mad Magazine was back, you would also have super specials back and stuff like that. So that's, right. I didn't that's where that. you can have that re that that reissued material, you know. Yeah, and that's what like like really connects the generations of Mad readers are those super specials, you know. It makes oh, yeah. it so that like if you're a ten year old reading Mad, you can talk to like you know your grandpa who read Mad, and like you can relate, you know. Yeah, because there's like some through lines there. Boy, they're really socking it to that Spiro Agnew guy again. He must work there or something. Yeah, they're like, hey, look at this. It's called Starchy. 
I know Archie. Do you know Starchy, Granddad? He'd be like, <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> I don't remember anything that happened in the last two weeks, but <laughs> I remember Starchy. Everything about Starchy. Um, yeah. So would Susie be at the helm? Yeah. Yeah, she's earned her place, I think, for sure. Yeah. Like, I think uh, you turn it around. You gotta keep, you gotta keep Susie until she's she, she she wants to leave. You keep Susie. You get but um, big staff. The rest you, of staff. You, know, you bring take me on as people. assistant art director. There you go. Well, that might be assistant to the place, art director. <laughs> there you go. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would love to be able to make a decision for once in my life. <laughs> well. That's beautiful, man. That was beautiful. Hey, let's move on to that next apartment. Here we are. We're at the Tips for Twits department. All right. You got any uh, good tips for twits today, Patrick? I do. I have. Uh, it's Listen, I went with, in the first episode, something that is not recent, something that I am not on the, the latest fad. And so I decided to double down on that. And I'm going to uh, suggest a book. Take a look. It's in a book. A reading rainbow. A novel from 1946 called Mr. Roberts. You might know this. This book was made into a, a Broadway play. This book was then made into a um, Hollywood film. The Hollywood film, who did it have in it? It had uh, James Cagney, Henry Fonda, William Powell, and... Jack Lemon. This is the second time I've read this book, and this book captures. When was the first time you read it? First time I read it, uh, it was probably in my early twenties. So you were out in a boat. Yeah, yeah. I was. I think I was just out of the navy when I read it. Okay. But this is the thing. It's a comedic novel. It's um, a series of stories that are like connected, not as like an overarching narrative, just as like these little vignettes of, of things that happen on the uh, the USS Reluctant which is a supply ship. And for anybody that's been in the military in a non-combat role, this book captures life aboard a ship like nothing I've ever read. It's just amazing. It's silly. It's funny. Um, they're just constantly fucking around and fucking with each other. And um, it's great. There's, there's sort of a tragic story behind it. Thomas Hagen ended up supposed that he killed himself he was sort of overcome with the fame that this novel brought him and he uh killed himself but it's one of the funniest stories i have ever read and i've i it's not often that i laugh out loud when i'm reading a book with words in it yeah i well so reflexively i was uninterested because it was a book um <laughs> Just kidding. I do like books as well. You actually did kind of interest me when you said that it, it really like gets across what it's like to be on a boat and sort of like that in a very specific like career capacity. Because I remember reading uh, Down and Out in Paris and London mm -hmm. and feeling the same way in the way that it talks about like working in a kitchen there. And I remember like I was really interested in that. So when you say that, it kind of like it makes me think like, oh, I wonder if I could recapture that enjoyment I had of reading that and kind of feeling like I was immersed in that environment. Yeah. It's one of those things that because I ex I had experience in something very similar, I have a hard time recommending the book because I'm I'm never certain if it's something that can transfer to somebody who didn't experience it. However, I mean, they did make a, a fucking Broadway musical and a, a movie out of it. So there has to be something in it that can be appreciated if you have not experienced it yourself. Well, you know, I think people like things that they don't experience. So like here, I'm in Nova Scotia in the Maritimes of Canada. Yeah. And uh, we get a lot of Japanese tourists who are really into Anna Green Gables because for them, that's like a very foreign experience. So especially on Prince Edward Island, but even here, like there's a, like there's a real like romance for this area of the world in Japan. Wow. Very cool. Hey, what's your tip? Well, wait, I want to know how many liters of chicken fat you're going to give this. How many liters? I, well, I go by the, the imperial system. So I'll go by quarts, quarts. Of... <laughs> oh, you're going quarts. Okay. <laughs> I'll do the math later. <laughs> this for me, this is this is four and a half quarts. Out of five quarts. Out of five quarts. That's all you need to know. It's it's out of five. So yeah. four and a half. Yeah. That's a strong recommendation. Heck yeah. Well, I have a strong recommendation too. So I talked earlier about how, you know, when I was a kid I used to rent R rated movies and I saw all the horror movies in my town. Well, a lot of those horror movies I have really fond memories of, but you know, you go back and watch them and maybe they're not as good as you remember. But I recently rewatched this one. 
and it blew my mind how good it was to the point where it's like I didn't appreciate it enough when I saw it when I was 12. And that movie is Basket Case from 1982. I've never heard of this. I actually have some pictures. So you don't even need to look it up. Um, here's the poster. Ooh. So it's about this hokey country boy, and he shows up at this hotel on 42nd Street in New York City, you know, where it's like all the grindhouse film theaters are. There's just crime and prostitution and like, and he's got this big basket. And he checks into like a seedy motel. He flashes his big wad of cash and then he leaves without the basket. But he's staying in the motel. So there's like all this sort of speculation about what's in the basket. What's in the basket? My brother. What's in the basket? Open it if you dare. Basket case. We quickly find out that in the basket is his formerly conjoined twin, Belial, <gasps> who like was growing out of his side when he was a kid and they have like a psychic link. But when he was a teenager, they removed Belial and they were basically, his parents were like, throw him in the garbage. It doesn't matter. I don't know if they had yeah. like a, an accent like that, but you know, like they were like, they were really like shitty to Belial. Um, they didn't consider him human. Like they're like, oh, is it human? So it's Dwayne and Belial Bradley. Dwayne, the, the brother who's like ostensibly normal, he knows that Belial is like a person. Yeah. He's yeah. got like this rich inner life. But so first of all, they're in New York to get revenge on the doctors who separated them. They're, they're murdering them, basically. He tracks them down and then Belial kills them. But while well, he's in the city. Have you, have you considered the fact that you're recommending a movie and then like spoiling plot points? Oh, well, I mean, spoilers. <laughs> I'm not going to say the end. This is this is the basic plot that you would find out in the first like 10 minutes of the film. So, but what happens is as they're apart, Dwayne starts being able to like cope and live normally while Belial is wreaking havoc in the in the hotel. Yeah. And there's this great symbolic duality between the characters where like Belial is like like the id of Dwayne. And so like Dwayne is this like like kind of good guy who's going around and he can, you know, he's kind of good looking. He can get with the women. He's kind of like innocent and nice and friendly. And then Belial is like just his like, you know, sexual impulses, his anger, all this is definitely not for children. And there is nudity and graphic violence. And I think the thing that makes this really interesting is that it it's the whole thing is done on a shoestring bu budget the director frank hennenlotter I, I probably pronounced that wrong he basically put in his life savings of fifteen thousand dollars and it shows and i think they yeah. raised some more money as they went and i think the whole movie was probably like twenty to thirty thousand dollars like it's very cheaply made and the acting is really stilted and all the actors, like, they didn't go on to anything else unless it was more of his films, which he did a few after. Uh, and the effects are all really hokey. But it has this real dreamlike quality that just really works in a way that, like, there's dozens of other films that are the same kind of story behind it that don't yeah. work in the same way that this one does. It has comedic elements, but I wouldn't call it a horror comedy. Like, it's it still plays off as a horror. Yeah. Uh, and there's two sequels that are not as good, but, you know, you check them out anyway. So the effects get a lot better and oh, there's yeah. all these other weird freak characters in the other ones. But the first one is just the whole thing comes together. It's almost poetic in a sense. And I just love it. Overall, I give it uh, four liters of chicken fat out of five liters, which as everyone knows is a half decaliter. Strong recommendation from me for Basket Case from 1982. Excellent. Hey, let's move on to that next apartment. <laughs> Hey, and welcome to the Letter Rip Department. Yes, that's right. This is where we read uh, letters from listeners and then also just letters. Yeah, and it, you can send us a letter. Uh, PottersEBPodcast at gmail.com, subject line, idiot mail. And please address your letter, dear idiots, or, you know, hey, idiots, or you idiots, or you are a bunch of idiots, you know, whatever. Hey, dumb dumb. Well, not dumb dumb. That's insulting. I find that insulting. But, you know, I don't want our dumb dumb listeners calling us dumb dumbs. <laughs> oh, yeah, good point. They're the dumb dumbs. We're the idiots. Exactly. All but, right. you know, they're kind of idiots, too, for listening to this. I mean that from the heart. Well, certainly. Hey, let's bring up that first letter. First letter. This comes from Viz Humor Magazine. As I was walking to the shops the other day with my five-year-old daughter, a lorry driver beeped his horn at me and shouted, For 
Look at the tits on that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a sunny day, and I was wearing a short skirt at the time. With so many miserable faces in the world these days, wouldn't it be nice if a few more people were as friendly as this a little more often? <laughs> Miss B. Idiot from Stoke-on-Trent. What do you think, Kyle? Do you think people are more, more friendly these days? Yeah, I mean, it's true. Like, everyone's walking around. We're all afraid of our neighbors. No one wants to just kind of get together at the sock hop or mm -hmm. the ice cream social and just, you know, kind of sexually harass each other. <clears throat> and, you know, I think that is symbolic of a, of a better time in our past. You know, the golden era of... Catcalling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Potter's EV Podcast does not endorse catcalling women. <laughs> All right, next letter. All right, this one, again, comes from Viz Magazine. The, the letterbox, that's what they called this. They say, no news is good news. Well, my grandfather went on a two-week camping holiday in Zambia in 1952 and hasn't been seen since. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I hardly think the saying applies in this case. C. Westman from Hollywood. <laughs> Do you think... Do you think people are too optimistic, Kyle? Oh, absolutely. I hate I hate op optimism. I hate sincerity. Like when people are optimistic or sincere around me, I get very uh, skeptical. You know, because like, what are you trying to hide? You know, I noticed that. Yeah, I like I like a nice veneer of irony. At least I know where people stand. Then you know, this letter kind of reminds me of uh, that great play, Death of a Salesman. You know, he had the uncle that went into the jungle and then came out a millionaire. Mm. And, you know, maybe uh, maybe he'll come out one day. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think in this case, no news is still no news. So we'll wait and see, I guess. Certainly isn't bad news. Although it could be like that Cannibal Holocaust movie. That didn't turn out so well either. So it's neutral. I'd say it's neutral. Neutral. New news is news. All right. And that's enough news, I think, for today. <laughs> so let's move on to our next department. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Begging and Groveling Department. That's right, folks. This is where we, we really kind of lean on you <laughs> to stroke our egos and uh, help us out. Because, you know, we wouldn't be doing this podcast if we were comfortable in our own bodies. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen to your old pals, Kyle and Patty, all right? We, we don't ask for much, all right? You can just check out our stuff. How about that? And, you know, we do it in one department. So unlike other podcasts where they're trying to hit you up all the way through, you know, we save it to the end and then we really lay it on thick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, where can they find you, Kyle? Me? Well, you can find me at my website at kylebridget.com and everywhere else I'm at Little Cozy Nostril, including on YouTube where I'm at Little Cozy Nostril. And I stream every Sunday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Central Time in the Nostril Zone where we listen to tunes and draw cartoons as well uh, I have a series called Canonically Crumb on there where I explore the comics and characters of R. Crumb's Crummyverse. Very good. You can find me at uh, flippinthrough.com. That has all my relevant links, but the most relevant is youtube.com slash at sign flippinthrough. I think I got that one right. Who knows, though? Just look it up on the search engine. You'll find it. And I'm not going to take too long to say this because you can't see it, but I'm on my knees um, not because I'm begging, but because I can't afford his care, pants so. fell down. <laughs> <laughs> we, we really want you to uh, review on uh, iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, put in however many, uh, whatever their scale of uh, chicken fat is, do the whole thing and leave a comment and a review or whatever they call it. That really helps. And if you're watching this on YouTube, like and subscribe, leave a comment. All right. Well, that's enough of this. I, I got my pride. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Patty. Thanks. I'm Kyle. We'll see you in two weeks. By the way, Ed, how's your mom? I'm sorry. Did you just... That's a funny joke I just made. Just all tw <laughs> just 24 issues of only Tintin in the Congo. I'm sorry. Yeah, anyway. <laughs>